our next speaker, who is also our earlier morning speaker, is of course Johnny Campbell, known as the Transition Man, is a speaker, author, and expert at helping people develop the mental readiness to embrace change. And boy, do we need it more now than ever. He has shared the stage with many thought leaders and celebrities from around the country and has even appeared in several movies and on television, and most recently at a TEDx event in Ocala, Florida. Johnny has served as the president of the National Speakers Association for the state of Illinois and has earned the designation of accredited speaker. That designation by Toastmasters International is held by less than 100 professional speakers in the world for excellence in public speaking. So that is quite an accreditation. Johnny's programs are not only entertaining, but filled with practical and pragmatic methods that have helped thousands of people achieve more success, more money, and more happiness in their lives. His presentation is called Embracing the Winds of Change. Oh, uh, oh sorry, 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 sorry. I only have one. It's the same one. So uh, this one is Let the Party Begin. Win the Crowd. Win the Crowd. I'm sorry about that, sir. I only had one announcement for you. So, so win the crowd, and with that, let's welcome Johnny Campbell. All right. Well, I'm so I'm glad to be back here again with everyone, and I just want everyone to know that it's been a pleasure to be with you this morning and to do this workshop this afternoon here. And what I want to do is kind of give you a little bit more to the story of the speaker you're listening to here. Besides working in corporate America. I've spent 20 years as a professional speaker, and this is what I've been doing over my career. But I'll give you a little bit of backdrop on me. When I joined Toastmasters, I joined Toastmasters because I wanted to improve my presentation skills and my overall delivery. I had been a corporate trainer, so I'd already been in front of groups speaking, but I wanted to make money from my presentations. So I joined Toastmasters to gain the structural understanding I need to craft better speeches. So I'm going to show you, my, I'm going to date myself here. Back when people used to get what was called a CTM, which is now a CC. But back then, what I did was I joined Toastmasters. I had one speech and I did that speech 10 times based on the manual. So I broke my 45 minute keynote speech into the first 10 modules now, pathway, the first 10 modules, back then the first 10 speeches to create a great keynote presentation. So I never really had 10 talks. I had one awesome talk. So the reason I share that is because total measures can be whatever you want it to be in your own personal development. And joining Toastmasters, one of the most important things is to have those members of that club understand who the members are and truly what their goals and objectives are. And because that particular club really understood who I was and what I was trying to accomplish, they nurtured that, and that created such a sense of community and loyalty to, to me. So I stayed with Toastmasters and have been with Toastmasters. I was in Chicago, and now I live in outside of Orlando, Florida, in a place called Claremont, Florida. But I live well over 17 years in the Chicagoland area. So I was very loyal to District 30. Now it's got other districts now, but that was the district. And I'm, and I'm sharing that with you because also, when you feel this kinship and this connection, those individuals become your greatest champion. So when you have new people and you really try to understand why they're there and what they want to become, in that care, they become some of your best members in the long run. And I served as a, at the time it was called an area governor, and I became a DTM in two and a half years. So I really got involved with the organization and moved through it. And then after becoming a DTM, I did compete in some speech contests, and then in 2007, I became an accredited speaker. But all of this happened because of that interest that my club had 
when I became, when I joined that club. And I learned that that was a part of leadership, having that interest in your members, really being interested in what they want to accomplish and helping to put them in a situation so that they can get what they need from the club. And that to me was what leadership was all about and what communication was all about. And that's what I encourage everyone to do here is if you want to grow your club, get interested in what those members really want. Some people are just trying to overcome their fears, but then there are others who want more from it. And if you really get to understanding what their needs are and you really work to put them in that situation, you'll be amazed at how loyal and committed they will be to the club. And that really is what brings me to where I am right now. When we talk about win the crowd and we talk about delivering great presentations, a lot of people talk about a lot of different aspects of becoming a great presenter. And for me, my position is that I talk about structure first. See, a lot of times, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with it, there are people that are storytellers. There are people who are humorous. There are people who believe in vocal variety and body mechanics as a part of their communication. But it always starts at the core, at the root, and that's with structure. And so this presentation that you're going to hear is really about how you structure the talk so that all those other things work harmoniously together. Now, one of the things about Win the Crowd, and the reason I named it this, is because when it comes to delivering a presentation, it is not about you, the presenter. It's about the audience, your clients, your customers. It's about them. You've got to win them over first. That's who you need to win. So that's why this quote here is one by Winston Churchill that I love the most is, before you can inspire with emotion, you must be swamped with it yourself. Before you can move their tears, your own must flow. To convince them, you must yourself believe. And you have to believe that what you have to tell them is going to make a difference in their lives. See, so when you think about the audience more than you think about yourself, suddenly your presentations will just get better. You'll still have to practice and rehearse. But when you think more about them, then suddenly you'll start to see things in your presentation that can be even better. Now, as a professional speaker, I want you to understand that this is my actual career. I don't do anything else. I don't have any other side jobs, any in-between jobs. I speak between 40 to 45 times a year, and my fees run from... 5,000 to 7,500 to speak. This is all that I do. So I get paid to talk about certain topics. So that's why, as you can see with the, uh, what's going on, that can have a startling effect on a person like myself. But I've been able to figure out ways to still get out here and deliver my message online. But I want you to understand that I'm coming from a place where I'm paid to win the crowd. They want me to get that message across to their audience, to their group. They want me to show them how they can be better presenters to make more sales. So I'm coming from that place when I talk about these concepts. Win the crowd. I always show this to everybody here as kind of an origin story. The win the crowd concept comes from Gladiator. And this is where the older man tells Russell Crowe's character that message. Listen to me, learn from me. I was not the best because I killed quickly. I was the best because the crowd loved me. Win the crowd and you win your freedom. And I started to realize I didn't have to be the funniest guy on stage. I didn't have to tell the best stories on stage. I didn't have to be at the extreme of any of these things. I had to be the best overall presenter on stage. And I had to be able to win the crowd. And if I won the crowd, then I could stand on stage and present my message and have the same impact as someone who was way more famous than me. And I've had the chance to share the stage with a lot of famous people. And they're up there speaking, and they're famous. 
So the audience is listening to them. But when I get up on stage, they don't know who I am. So I have to win them over. And the only way to win them over is to talk about them. Not about me, talk about them. And by doing that, by the end of my talk, I have won them over. Not because I said something extraordinary about myself, but I said something that matters to them, both in their heart and in their mind. So that's kind of the idea behind win the crowd. So let's go ahead and get started here. Where are we going to start with this concept? We start with the anxieties here for those that are listening. The three anxieties that most people have when it comes to <clears throat> their speaking. Doubts, then there's worries, and then there's fears. And by the end of this presentation, I'm going to eliminate well over 50% of anyone's doubts, worries, and fears if they have concerns about presenting their message. Because I'm going to give you a process to think about and a way of doing it. I always show this right here. And I show these slides here because I want everyone to think about for a moment, their own voice. And when you think about your voice, we hear voices that resonate with us, voices that are special, like you've got Dr. King there. You've got, and, and the next one over from Dr. King, James or Ray, but here's the thing, that's the voice of CNN for those who don't know. That's Darth Vader's voice right there. Then there's the rock star next to it, Joe Osteen. You know his hair never moves, it's perfect the whole time. Monotoned, but the world listens to him. Then there's Joyce Myers, her voice, very unique. Ronald Reagan, Orson Welles, and who doesn't know Morgan Freeman, the voice of God? Who doesn't know that voice? And then Maya Angelou. The reason I share, share them is because each of them has a unique voice, but we all have a unique voice. Never try to modify your voice, but improve your voice. And if you have an, if you're listening and you have an accent, I want you to remember this. Your accent is your asset as a communicator. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you unique. So if you have an accent, don't ever say to yourself, I've got to get rid of this accent. No, you need to enhance that accent. And if someone is listening and they're from an international, in other words, there's someone with a heavy, heavy accent and they feel like they're hard to understand. I used to, in Chicago, have members that were from India and other places around the world that come to our club. We never tried to get them to get rid of their accent. All we taught them to do was slow down. When they talked a little bit slower, their words got much clearer. It was the speed that they spoke that caused us to stumble in our understanding. But as they slowed down, we were able to understand them clearly. So don't ever let your accent or believe that your accent's a detriment to you becoming a great communicator. So I always kind of leave that out. I always include that in there for those that may think that that's something that's holding them back. All right, the two reasons why most people's presentations fail to hit the mark. Why do they fail to hit the mark? Here's one of the things that, and this is something that when I coach people or I work with people, I try to remind them about. They say, well, Johnny, I've got a story to tell, or I've got this message I want to get across. And I tell them that herein lies the problem. You've got a story to tell, and you've got a message to get across. That's the problem, because that's not where it all starts at. It starts with this, a goal. The goals that you have for your presentation. What is the presentation's supposed to do? In other words, you say, you know, I got a message, but what is it? What is solved? What problem is it solving? What solution is it offering? Understand what the outcome is first. What are we trying to accomplish here? Never mind the story at first. Say to yourself, when I'm done with this audience, they're supposed to be in this state of mind. They're supposed to feel this way or they're supposed to do something. Know what that is first. Don't worry about the stories because the stories will work if you know what the outcome is. You have to, if you're gonna create, and if you're gonna create <clears throat> a great story, you have to begin with the end in mind first. What is the outcome that's supposed to happen? And you build backwards. 
But what we what I see people doing is they create they have these stories and they jam them into the concept. And it's that's and to me that's backwards. The other part that keeps them from doing a great presentation is the overall organization of the presentation. Because they don't think about the outcome first, they don't position the, the, the message in the right way. And then the stories don't work. So you gotta have an outcome that you want, but what is the message that you're trying to get across? And then the stories, see stories, and, I'll, and this will be at the end as well, Stories support the message that helps produce the outcome you're looking for. So what people do is they put stories first, then they figure out what my message is, and then they, then they wonder why the outcome doesn't happen. As a presenter myself, my job is to get people to get up and go do something when I'm done talking. So I got to know what the audience, what the client that hires me wants first. What's supposed to happen? Once I know that, then I create my message and then I figure out which stories are appropriate. But if I do it the other way around, at the end of my talk, they might say, awesome story, but they're not doing anything. They're not taking action on anything. And that means I didn't do my job. And when you are up on stage, you gotta know what's supposed to happen at the end of this thing. As much as you wanna tell your story, you got to say, I've got to make sure at the end that this happens, and then you build. So the key to a great presentation is structure. Structure is where it's at. And for myself, that's what I really worked on, is how to structurally put together a talk. And what I'm going to give you here <clears throat> is a template on how to structure a talk. And here's the thing. When we think about the elements of a great presentation, no matter what you are selling, no matter what you are offering, no matter what you are proposing, if you can meet these three criteria inside of your presentation, people will buy what you're selling. They will act upon it. They will do something about it. Clarity, confidence, and certainty. These are the emotional underlining emotional drivers that cause people to want to do whatever you're proposing. In your talk, it has to be clear. The audience has to have confidence in themselves and they have to have a sense of certainty that it will work. I want you to think about the things that you bought in your life. You bought, and everyone probably has some form of insurance. Insurance is not exciting, but people buy it. Why? Because of clarity, they have a confidence in what it's supposed to do, and a sense of certainty is what's supposed to happen if something happens. Any product, any service that fulfills these three gets sold a lot, and people buy a lot. We And if you do not feel one of these here, you will not buy that product. If you feel that, you, if you're not clear, you won't buy. If you don't feel confident that it will do what it says it will do, you won't buy. If you don't have a sense of certainty that it will work, you won't buy. But anyone that has conveyed these three key points in their messaging to you, and you're already interested in it, you're going to buy it. That's what I discovered. And so that became some key elements that are always in the underlining of my message. I always want to make sure it's clear. I want to make sure the audience feels confident that what I'm sharing with them is going to help them and give them a sense of certainty that it will work. These are the things when you're trying to structure a talk. This is the foundation that your talk sits upon. Remember, you got your structure, you got your message, then your stories. Stories are, in, are at the end. They support it, but it's the outcome that we're looking for first. What is that outcome? Message in the stories. These right here are those underlining guiding principles. In this win the crowd process here that I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about know the outcome of your audience, understand your audience, and choosing the right words. And my promise is that at the end of this talk, you will understand each of these key ideas. So let's get started with them here, these, these principles. The first one is this. 
when you are developing your presentation, you have to know what the outcome is first. What are they supposed to be, do, or have if they listen to your message? Or be, do, have, or achieve because of your message. They listen to you. What is the outcome? You need to know what that outcome is before you even speak to them. As you can see right here, their mode is be, do, and have. The next key thing here, I have to know in the outcome is to remember this, in key, this important thing here. When you speak, sell, or offer products or services or anything, you're asking people to embrace change. Whenever you're in front of an audience trying to influence them, that's change. Whenever you are trying to convince them to see the world in a new way, that's change. Realize that what we're trying to do here is help them embrace change. That's why clarity, confidence, and certainty is so important. Because as people listen to you, they're saying, I could be as I am, but you're asking me to become different. I've got, and as they listen to that, you've got to be offering them a pathway. Start with the outcome first. The next key thing here is understanding your audience. Know the outcome that you want for your audience. Then whatever your message is, what you are proposing, you must understand the values and beliefs they currently have about that thing. Whatever you're talking about, if you're talking about change or you're talking about success in life, in some area of life, know what their current values and beliefs are about it. Because by knowing their values and beliefs, you, have, you may have to shift their behavior toward that. Notice when I gave the example of that in my, in my morning talk, I talked about I'm trying to help people embrace change, and I know most people do not like change. So I know their values and beliefs are that I don't really like change. So I'm saying, okay, I know you don't like change, but how about we talk about transition? And suddenly people pause for a moment and say, what do you mean by transition? And then I show them that people don't change, they transition through change. What I'm doing there is I'm expanding their value system about change now. I'm causing them to see it in a different way. I already know they're resistant to the current way based on their values and beliefs. So I've got to get them to see this in a new way. So you have to understand when you're dealing with an audience, where, how do they currently see what you're already talking about? And you may have to help them see it in a new way. Or sometimes you may have to expand how they see it, but you gotta know what their values and beliefs are about it. The next thing is you gotta know what's standing in their way of accepting this new, this new idea that you wanna share. Now their values and beliefs, that's an internal thing, but are there external forces that are keeping them from accepting this new way? Is there something that's preventing them from it? You know, and that's what you have to understand. What could be standing in their way from receiving this message and taking action on this message? In business, it could be, well, we don't have enough money, or we don't have any money, or that's a bit expensive, or we don't have enough staff, or we don't have something. Whatever it is that you know could be standing in their way of receiving it, that has to be in your message so that they understand that you understand what could stand in their way. In other words, someone says, well, that's a little expensive, Johnny. Take it, you simply say, you know what? What I'm proposing will be an investment, but this investment can be broken down into monthly payments. This investment can be staggered over time. This investment will be structured in a way that you will be able to get a clear return on your investment. You have to understand what can be standing in someone's way from saying yes or agreeing with you, or wanting to go forward with you. Next thing, understanding objections. Sometimes objections are not from the person. Sometimes we and ourselves have objections. And there was a time where I, I did a presentation for a group. And this group was a group of country Western real retailers. This was about, there was about 350 alpha male cowboys who sell country wear 
and buck, those big those big belt buckles and boots and all of that kind of stuff. And I got a call from a lady named Rose. And Rose called me up and she said, Johnny Campbell, we've heard about you and we would love for you to come to Denver, Colorado for our Country Western Retailers Association Conference and be our keynote speaker. And when she said it, I, I, I was on the phone with her and I said, Rose, did you see my website? You do know what I look like, Rose. Nothing about me says country western retailer rules. And she said, no, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And in life, you know how you have that moment where you say, you know what? This is going to end badly. Somehow you have this feeling. But the money is good and Johnny Campbell's flying. So I agreed. I said, I got to go. I got to go do this. So I fly out there. I arrive there at the convention center. Go inside, 350 guys walking around, cowboy hats on, belt buckles, big hats on and everything. Rose walks up. Rose is five feet tall, beat red hair, and just is happy to see me. And says, Johnny, I'm going to take you around so you can meet some people. So she takes me around. And as I walk around, she introduces me to a guy, and he's polishing some boots and things. And he looks up at me and says, oh, you're the speaker, huh? Well, right there. I'd already started getting concerned when he said, oh, you're the speaker, huh? So Rose takes you to another person. And this guy's got those big belt buckles with the big old plates on the front of them. And he looks, and she says, Rose says, this is our speaker. And he looks at me and he says, really? You're the speaker? And I start thinking, like, this is not good. Rose takes me to one more guy here, and he's got all kinds of, just ropes and all kinds of other stuff and cowboy stuff. And I said, no, never mind, Rose. I don't even want to meet that guy. I don't even want to meet. And she says, okay, well, go ahead and get ready. Well, I'm I'm messed up in my mind right now because Rose done got me all messed up because the audience might not like me. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So I sit behind the stage there. I get up on the stage, get behind the curtain, and get ready to get ready to be introduced. Rose stands out front, talks to the audience. 350 cowboys with hats on in the building are staring at her like a Roman soldier. And I'm saying to my, and I peek out there and I see them. No one's laughing and no one's smiling. In my mind, I said, if there's a God above, this is the moment. Take me away, Lord, right now. Just take me away. But the Lord doesn't show up and I've already cast the check. So I guess we're going to have to do this one. And I walk out there, and as I walk out there and being introduced, I walk out there, and my first comment to everybody is simply, if you're here today to have more success, more money, more happiness, and sell more of your country western retailer stuff, give me a yippee ki 350 hats go flying in the air. The cowboys start laughing and hooting and hollering. And I'm able to do my talk. And I walk off the stage. When I'm done, definitely drenched in sweat because I was like, oh, my goodness, I got out of this thing. But in my mind, I was so caught up that they wouldn't like me. And one guy said he loved me so much that he gave me a gift to always remember my time with the country western retailers. There you go right there, everybody. Just so that I would always and never forget my time with them. As I told you before, nothing about me looks like cowboy right there. That is total Chicago man right there. And when I looked at this photograph here, I thought about an old television show. Look at that guy over there. That was from Texas Walker. That was Chuck Norris's sidekick right there with that same hat on right there. And, I, and I'll have you know that is a Stetson hat that I am strutting around in right there. And I didn't know how expensive they were until I started looking around and realized. I said, oh, my God, this is like a really expensive hat. So I, so I, but, I, but he gave me that as a gift to thank me for being there at the conference. And the reality, what I, what I want to share with you about it is <clears throat> I was caught up in myself. I had forgot I should be there for them. I was making judgments about me, saying that they won't like me. Here's what I'm trying to get across to everybody. 
it doesn't matter what you look like, your height, your weight, your religion, your sexuality, all that's irrelevant. As long as you've got the message that they need to hear to be better. It doesn't matter what you look like. What matters is what you say to them to make them better. I got that job because they said this, our organization, our industry is going through change and we need someone to help us look at things in a different way. I was there to help them see the world in a new way, in a better way, so that they could be more successful in their businesses. But a lot of times what happens to us is that we look at ourselves and make judgments. And even I, after all my years of speaking, can get caught in that. And I have to remind myself that it doesn't matter about me. I'm there for them. And I have spoken to some of the most diverse audiences imaginable because I was there to help them cope with change, to help them be more successful in their business. But it's so easy to have those objections in our own head that sabotages our great speech. So I want you to remember when you feel those doubts and worries in your own head, think about yourself for a moment. Think about it and say, I'm there for them. And get out of your head and start thinking about what they need. And that's how you start to be able to do a better presentation. Also, when you present, know your environment. One of the things, now we're in a new world right now. This district, for those that don't know, has really done an outstanding job to practice and prepare for these moments here. They have studied and they have learned. They have learned their new environments. When you present a message, you must know your environment, where you're going to speak at. If I was at your district conference and I did my keynote this morning, I'd have already been downstairs. If this would have been a live event, I'd have been downstairs at eight o'clock on the dot, if not a little bit earlier, to do sound check, to prepare myself, to notice the environment that I was going to be speaking in. So that when the so when it was showtime, I was ready to go. You've got to know your environment to craft a great presentation. Know where things are, know where the angle of the audience is going to be, know where the PowerPoint slides are going to be at. If you're using PowerPoint slides, know where that slide deck is going to be sitting at. Because you want to make sure everything is positioned correctly so you can deliver the best talk for them. See, a lot of times people think when someone is fussy about these things that they're they are prima donna. A lot of times they're not. What they are is they're trying to make sure they create the most effective effect for the audience. And they fuss about things because they know what it takes to do a great job for the audience. That's why environment is so important. So you got to know your environment. Lastly, of course, when you do a presentation, your clothes, your call to action. I said it in the beginning, though. The outcome. What's the outcome that we want? you got to know what that is. Another key thing here is this. If you can't write your message in a sentence, you can't say it in an hour. One of the things about delivering a presentation is it has to have a clear message. I had the opportunity a couple years ago to do a TEDx talk. And the TEDx talk I delivered was called How an Enemy Can Improve Your Life. And I talked about the value of competition and how competition is a catalyst for improvement. And without competition, there is complacency in the world and in people's lives. And competition, whether it's internal or external, makes a difference. And so in my talk, if you go on YouTube, you'll see it. It's called How an Enemy Can Improve Your Life. And you'll see me place this argument, because that was my message, that competition makes us better. That was my message I was trying to get across. But for those that want to, are interested in a TEDx talk, let me explain to you how that worked for me. I got tapped on the shoulder to do a TEDx talk. A, a TEDx organizer heard me somewhere. They were in the audience. So I guess that was my audition. They heard me and they said, we, I want you to be in our TEDx talk. And I joked with the TEDx organizer and I said, who's Ted? What Ted want with me? Because I said, I don't know any TEDx. I don't know any TED guys. So I was messing with them. But I said, yeah, I'll do it. And 
when I got involved with it, I said, oh my goodness. I watched other videos and I really started to think about it. And I said, I want this to be something really special. I had 90 days to get ready. I spent 60 days writing, everybody. 60 days writing. Because I only got, I think they gave me 14 minutes in mind. So I sat there for 60 days and wrote. I only needed 30 to rehearse because I knew I could prepare myself on stage. But I spent 60 days writing. The tighter the time, the more you have to cut things, the more you have to focus. And when it says message, you want a clear message of what you are trying to convey. My message was how an enemy can improve your life. I was arguing like an, like an attorney, a one-sided position. I wasn't trying to give people options or other viewpoints. I was like, this is the only way. That's what I mean by you really have to choose your words when you're doing presentations because you're trying to create one outcome, one effect. So I wanted everyone to think about that. So that, like I said before, if you go to YouTube, you'll find it on there, how an enemy can improve your life. And you'll see how I argue this position. Now, of course, someone could argue against me, but that wasn't my job that day. My job was to state my position and place my argument why it made sense. And really, when you do a TEDx talk, to me, that's what it's really about. Now, there are other TEDx talks that do a lot of different things, but I needed a talk that showcased me as a speaker talking, on an, talking in the area of my expertise. Here's where your story comes into play. You know all of these other elements. Now you can tell your story. See, your story anchors to your message, to the outcome, to the audience's values and beliefs. All of these other things help that story be shaped in the right way. When you put a story ahead of the outcome, the audience's values and beliefs, the audience's objections, what's standing in their way, that story's not strong enough. But if you put the story behind all of that and then you tell it it becomes a powerful story that makes a difference in people's lives but a lot of people put it first instead of putting it last the two parts to the speech the message and the stories the message is your idea and your outcome the stories support the message humor body language and props come last you can find the funny once the story is structured right, then you can find the funny because the outcome is correct. When you've got a funny story, but you don't know the outcome of it, it just becomes a funny story. But if you're trying to tell something that's funny, that engages people, that produces an outcome, humor and body language and props are the last things you weave into that story. And it goes into the message that produces the outcome. So it's like the last thing. Here's the seven key, the seven keys right here. Know the outcome, your audience, objections, time frame, environment, message, and your clothes. Failing to prepare is to prepare to fail. One of the things after 20 years that still amazes me is that there are people out here that will get up on stage and not practice before they present. I practice everything. This is my profession, this is my career. I practice. How would you feel if you went to the doctor and the doctor did not practice before he did that procedure on you? You would say to yourself, well, doctor, are we ready to go? He said, well, I've never seen that before, but we're gonna try our best this time to see what happens. You'd be like, you're not gonna cut on me and not have worked on this. Well, if you're a person who speaks and you don't practice your speeches before you deliver them to audiences, then in my book, you're committing speaker malpractice. You have not prepared, and you're operating on that audience. You have to prepare yourself. You have to get yourself into the right state of mind, but also message-wise. you got to prepare yourself. I always include this right here. Table topics is an absolute must, so I always encourage everyone to think about one of the things about table topics, and this is where I learned it from, I had a chance to be in a pitch man contest. You ever seen the guys that sell 
and late at night, the QVC stuff, the knives and forks and stuff. Well, a guy taught me how to do that. And I actually won a pitch man contest out in Vegas. And I realized that the concepts to help them sell are the same things we do in table topics. And so I developed these core principles that if you keep these in mind, you will not be stumped when you do a table topics. No matter what they tell you, you will not be stumped because doing an impromptu is about structure. A lot of times people get up there and they look like, and they're just winging it. But when you don't know a lot about a topic, but you got to talk about a topic, there has to be structure so that you can say it correctly. So I created an audio on that. Practice isn't the thing that you do once you're good. It's the thing to do that makes you good. You always have to be practicing. Okay, everybody. Well, there you have it. As I always say, there you have it. What I've done in the time that we've had is I wanted to deliver to you some things that can make you better, that can improve you. One of my lovely Mark Twain quotes, if you want me to give you a two-hour presentation, I'm ready today. If you want only a five-minute speech, it will take me two weeks to prepare. In other words, it takes time and preparation. The less you have to speak, the more preparation you need. Yes, of course, someone can just ramble for hours. But when you want a concise message that makes a difference, a concise message that has impact, you have to work on that. You have to practice that. That's why I put together some things I want to show everybody here real quick. Oh, my goodness. I see someone with a cowboy hat on. <laughs> put some things together here. I've got two audios here that are part of a course that I've created that I'm going to show you here. The two audios are 20 bucks. But here's what I want to show you, what I call the full enchilada. This is a one-hour, as you can see, a one-hour presentation over there in audio where you can listen to it. Speaking off the cuff, never be stumped. Three hours of training on how to craft a message. Below here, I share in my course how you actually set up a full presentation step by step. So I tell you in the PowerPoint slide what goes in each and every slide. I have video here that shows you what goes in every slide as you craft your message. So this right here will teach you exactly how to craft a presentation that sells, that connects, and that persuades. I even, you, like I said, I even give you PowerPoints and I tell you what goes in every slide. I say, this is your transition slide, put it here. This is your call to action slide, put it here. So I tell you every slide what to do so that you don't get lost as you're crafting these messages. There's another cowboy hat. <laughs> it's normally 397, but this is Toastmasters and this is family. So it's 147 lifetime access. As I told you this morning, if you decide to invest in this, I don't care if you use it or you share it with your club, whoever you want, doesn't bother me at all. I want those that are interested to take advantage of it so that they have this as a resource. This is all online, so I'm always updating it with new information. And you have lifetime access, one-time charge, 147. 147 there. Here's my last piece right here of the puzzle. As always, my simple purpose is to inspire you, but it's also to, to cause you to not give up. A lot of times people are right there at the moment when they want to give up, they want to stop. I want to help them not give up. As I said before, the big course is 147. If you're interested in it, all you've got to do, you can email me, johnny at transitionman.com. Or you can text me at my cell phone number right here, and then I will send you the link to this one. For those that are interested, I need to send this to you because I will auto enroll you in it directly so that you only pay $147. Other people pay a lot more for this, and they also have to pay continuously. I want this to be a one time deal for $147. So if you email me and say, send me the link to buy, I'll send you the link. Or you call me or you text me with your name and email and say, send me the link, I'll send it to you. But also what I want to do here now, if we have a few more minutes, is I'm open to answering anyone's questions about the accredited speaker program, 
being a professional speaker or presentation skills in general. So I'm open to answering any of those kind of questions if we have a little bit of time here for a moment. So I'll turn this, do I, do I have to turn it back over Great. or how does that work? No, you can just leave that up, that's fine. Uh, oh. Great job. Tell, so tell me a little bit about when you're talking to a group like this, what are the things that you try to picture in your mind about where you're trying to take this presentation? You mean, you mean the audience itself? Yes, yes. I, what I really want is the audience to have become better writers of their speeches. I want them to structurally become better. See, I was very fortunate that I had an English professor who worked at a junior college when I was working on my international speech contest. And he is the one that taught me to write my speeches out. And then we would review them and he would put me in front of his very cruel freshman English class. And I would have to do it in front of them and they would read it and listen to me. And I saw, it was painful at first, but I saw how much better I got as a writer, as a speech writer. And then here it is, you know, 18 years later, and I've written speeches for business professionals. I've even wrote speeches for local politicians before because I understand what it takes to write a speech that causes action to occur, that causes a sale to occur. So for me, I just wanted everyone to be better writers of their speeches, but basically understanding the key bullet points so that you know you're crafting a good message. What's my outcome? What's the objections? You know, what, what's going, now I say, okay, now I know the outcome, objections, their values and beliefs. Okay, now I can find the right stories to tell that support all of that. 